Hello and welcome to Motors for the Masses and today I want to talk to you about the seriousness of the vehicle world at the moment and where I think it's heading or not as the case may be. So let's roll the intro and get cracking. So I've come to the middle of a field in the van, obviously, and it's nice and quiet and peaceful here. So there's a few topics I want to discuss or talk about, and uh, it'd be nice to have your feedback in the comment section below as to what you think about what I'm going to be saying. Now, first of all, I do want to mention potholes, and I want to congratulate the local councils on doing half a job. Now, what I mean by that is, when they do the potholes, and they have started to do them recently, so kudos to them for that. Credit where credit's due. However, when they fill in a pothole, they don't seem to do it properly. I mean, it's like welding. You know, if you have a, a rusty hole, like... So <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you have a rusty hole about this big, see a doctor. Um, other than that... What you've got to do is cut out a larger piece and then weld fresh metal to it. Otherwise, it's just going to come back again and eat away. The same thing can be applied for potholes. What they seem to be doing is just going around, picking the biggest potholes, filling them in, putting tire around the edge and saying, yep, yeah, that's done. We've met our target for this month. But that's not what you need to do. You need to go beyond that dig up the road around it and create a nice flat surface and fill the pothole properly. And what they are doing is seem to be doing the big ones and even the little ones. So you've got a, a big patch that's been done and then all the little ones still there. Oh, comments on my scrambler build. Wow, it's been a while. Um, mind you, it is 1.2 million views. So thank you for that, everybody. Anyway, Back to what I was saying. Yes, so potholes. I, I don't understand why they just go along with a bag overnight, fill it all in, put a bit of tire around it. Job done. No, it isn't job done. Like I said, it's like welding. If you've got five or six potholes or maybe 20 in a certain little area, just dig it up and redo the whole bit. Otherwise, you're going to be back in a few months to do it again. Oh, well, perhaps that's what it is. So they've got a permanent contract that they could just go back and do it again and again and again and again. Yeah, well, it doesn't work. And it annoys people because you're not doing the job properly. Take a section of road and go, right, there's 50 potholes here of varying sizes. Let's just cut off the top surface and resurface the whole section. In other countries, they can do it overnight. So there's no reason why they can't do it here either. It's, it's pretty non-rocket science as far as I'm concerned but I'd like your views on that so yes credit where credit's due they're starting to do it no credit because there isn't any due you're not doing it properly at all I'm not saying I'm an expert I don't do potholes that's your job the pothole people and councils just do it properly now another thing is another bit of a rant I'm afraid um now, I understand this is going to be a bit of a contentious issue. Everyone was a learner once. I get that and I appreciate it and I understand, not a problem. But there should be a thing where people are not taught to drive between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. And especially around schools. Now, I take my son to school every day. I've already got to contend with parents taking their child to school so they generally struggle to understand the concept of parking properly and driving properly and and things like that now what we have to contend with is in and around that traffic congestion and the parking congestion is learners 
trying to navigate those roads. Now I understand, as I say, they're trying to teach them to uh, you know, navigate difficult situations, difficult roads, etc, etc. And there's plenty of spaces and plenty of time for that during the day. Not between the hours of 8 and 9 when you're taking your kids to school. Because all you're doing is frustrating everybody else, trying to get their kids to school and then get off to work, and just winding everybody up and making the whole situation a lot more stressful than it doesn't need to be. Now, what are your views on that? I'm probably going to divide the camp on that one, but it just seems a ludicrous idea. Now, every single day, and I mean this, every day that I take my son to school, there's learners in and around the school area. And to me, that's very unnecessary. When you've got cars parked down both sides, it's generally bad enough for people to pull out and navigate these parked, let's call them idiots, not all of them, um, in general, without having to sit behind a learner who's going, oh no, it's not quite safe enough for me to pull out. I'll just sit here. It's very frustrating. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, I'd like to call it vehicle tax, but it isn't really, is it? It's vehicle excise duty. Now, the tax we pay doesn't go towards roads, which is why it's not called a road tax. It's like council tax, it's divvied out like everything else. And a certain amount is given to this, 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 and this, and this, and, and a large percentage is given to politicians' wages. Different subject. However, there has been an increase in vehicle excise duty this year. Now, for cars, it's very complicated. And there's a whole list, and it all is based around your CO2 emissions on your vehicle. So for vehicles with these CO2 emissions, you get this much, and for the next bracket, you get that much. Um, and to save me reading them all out, I'm just going to put it up here. So it's up to you or the dealer you buy your vehicle from or wherever you get it from to look these up and see what tax bracket it falls in. Now, if you are, I'd like to say unlucky enough, but lucky enough to have a vehicle that produces 255 grams of CO2, you're going to be paying £2,600 a year for that tax. Now, of course, if you've got a vehicle that puts out that much, if it's an old vehicle, you don't want to be paying that in tax. If it's a new vehicle, then you've probably spent quite a lot of money buying the vehicle in the first place anyway. So another two and a half grand doesn't really phase you. However, if your vehicle is over £40,000 list price to buy, even if you've got it as a bargain and they've got three grand off or whatever, and it puts it under the 40 grand bracket. If the list price is over 40,000 pounds, you're gonna be paying an extra 390 pounds a year for the first five years on top of your tax. Now, the only thing that's exempt from this are zero emission vehicles. So if you've got one of those, then you're all right. Now, when it comes to bikes, they have gone up again this year. Now, for a 125 or up to, a 150cc, £24 a year. Between 151 and 400cc, it's £52 a year. For 401cc to 600, it's £80 a year. And for a big bike, so over 600cc, it's £111 a year. So we're all heading in a downward spiral. Tax is going up, toy vehicle excise duty is going up. Well, we all know it is road tax. Um, and there is a solution and the government have this solution but it's not necessarily a solution that we all agree with and that is the world is going electric now in the UK they are talking about an electric ban for all petrol diesel hybrid and light commercial vehicles by 2035 with a 55% CO2 reduction by 2030. Now, a lot of manufacturers are aiming for 2030, where they ban the sales of all new petrol diesel vehicles. And the big ones include Ford, uh, Renault, Peugeot, 
Um, the likes of Volkswagen and people like that are aiming for a 40% reduction in CO2s by 2030. Now, this isn't so cut and dry. Now, if you are a smaller manufacturer selling between 1,000 and 10,000 units or 1,000 and 22,000 vans, you are exempt until the end of 2035. However, most manufacturers seem to be heading for the 2030 cutoff, which means we've got seven years, six and a half years, basically, which to me basically means I think the cost of used vehicles will go up dramatically. Um, unless, of course, the cost of electric vehicles comes down dramatically. I don't know, they've got to really, if they want this to be viable and they want people to spend the money. Or finance deals will be unbelievably favourable with 0% finance going on all over the place. But uh, I don't know, it's, it's a hard one to tell at the moment. Obviously, we all know it's going electric and there's nothing we can do about that. It's happening, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's whether they're going to be set up to deal with it and whether people are going to be able to afford it. I really do think that the used market five to ten year old vehicles will be through the roof. I think the, the, the value of your vehicles will be a lot more when the electric ban comes in. However, it's also coming in for motorbikes and scooters. Now, the proposal is to ban all petrol motorcycles and scooters also by 2035 with proposals for 125s to disappear out of our showrooms by 2030. Basically anything under 14.8 brake horsepower. Okay, that's only six and a half years. Again, that's only for new vehicle sales. So again, the price and the cost of used 125s, as long as they're in decent condition, I think will go up. I don't know when they're going to plan to ban petrol completely. Well, I sort of do know, and we'll talk about that in a second. However, if they do get rid of petrol motorcycles and only go electric, is it going to ruin the motorcycle world? I mean, it'll make the motorcycle world faster, apart from the electric scooters that only do 30 mile an hour because Europe says anything over 30 is just a bit too dangerous for a 16 year old. Don't even get me started on that one. That's a whole new subject. Um, I really think, again, used vehicles will value will go up. Um, the ban is going to happen. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, they are talking about e-fuel, a synthetic petrol. Um, this will be a, a very low carbon or zero carbon petrol substitute to replace petrol now. Um, if that takes off and they've got the technology sorted out, there we go, there's the answer. If they don't, then who knows? But I, mean, I think six and a half years, the way technology is going these days and things are moving forward, maybe they'll do it. But let me know what you think about the e-fuel alternative. As long as we get the sound of a motorcycle still. I mean, again, I mean, look at my van, for example. It's diesel, but because of that um, exhaust system, electronic exhaust system, it sounds like a V8. That's the way forward, I think, for these vehicles. Synthetic exhaust systems, synthetic fuel, synthetic exhaust systems. <sighs> Who knows? You know, <laughs> this is the way we're heading. So as long as we get that sound and we get the power, is that going to be good enough? Again, let me know in the comment section below. Will you be happy with that if they have these alternatives? If they have electric vehicles with the sound of a motorcycle, would that be good enough for you? Let me know in the comment section below. Now, one of my big subjects I've talked about before is the infrastructure that isn't set up at all. What they're planning on doing, by 2035, the government plans to have 6,000 electric fast charge points throughout the UK. Now, you might think, oh, 6,000, that's quite good. But at the moment, they currently have 8,500 petrol stations around the UK. That's petrol stations. If you can imagine that... Each station has an average of, let's say, three pumps. That's 24,000 fill-up points that takes between three and five minutes to fill up. 
If these fast charges are 20 minutes, that's 20 minutes per stop, not three to five minutes per stop, and there's only 6,000 of them, and that's a plan to have 6,000 by 2035, not 24,000. Is that going to be enough? Now, I know you can argue that people will have their fast charge points at home as well, so maybe they won't need to go to these stations to fill up. But again, also, these, these fast charge points are probably only going to be on major A roads and motorways and stuff like that. So if you live out in the country, you've got to have a fast charge point and you've got to have a vehicle that's going to do distance to be able to get home again to charge up. Again, is it viable? Is it going to work? Now, the government are planning on being net zero carbon footprint by 2050. I'll be 76 at that point. I'd like to think I'll still be riding a bike and driving cars. I also like to think that we will have the, mind you again, will we have the noise? Will we be allowed to have the noise or will they have a noise ban on vehicles as well? Because people are a bit too upset and I've, I'm offended by that noise of that synthetic vehicles and it's upset me so much that I want to go and speak to my therapist for the next 12 years and it's going to cost me 94 million pounds and, and oh, oh, I'm going to break. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just being dramatic, but um, I understand we need to, you know, be more efficient in terms of how much fuel we use and the climate and everything else, but is it going to make the vehicle world boring? Is it going to make the world I see out there worthwhile riding through? I mean, look, I'm just going to show you. Look, I'm just going to turn you around a bit. That's my view at the moment. Now, we like to ride through that. We like to drive through that. You could argue, if we don't do this, will there be any of that left to ride and drive through? I don't have that answer. But then, do we want to ride and drive through all that if there's nothing to ride and drive through with that's exciting? I don't know the solution. I don't know the answer. Have you got the solution to the answer? Again, let me know in the comment section below. Are you running for local MP? Do you have the answer? Do you have, or do you work in the field of technology that's aiming towards getting this done? Where are we heading? That's a question to ponder on. For now, I'm just going to enjoy it as much as possible and hope the value of all my bikes that I've kept in the garage is going to go up and my cars. My concern is, will I have the fuel to run them on? And with a 7.2 litre V8 Mustang, it's going to need a bit of fuel. I don't know. I want to be able to use my Mustang, not have it sitting there looking pretty in a garage untouched, unused, unable to put fuel in it. And I can't convert it to electric. Oh, imagine that. A 429 cubic inch, 7.2 litre V8 Mustang. <laughs> electric. <laughs> Don't care how fast it is. It's not going to sound the same ever through a synthetic electronic system. Mind you, I don't know. Again, by that time, technology will be amazing, I like to think. I don't know. Like I said, for now, I'm just going to enjoy the world as it is. Get out on the bikes as much as possible, and I'd urge you to do the same. Get out on your bikes. Get out in your cars. Enjoy the roads. Enjoy life whilst you can. And then when you're forced to go electric, buy an electronic exhaust system because I think we're going to need them. And that brings me to the end of this episode. I'll be back next time with a review, but for now, I'm going to go home and cry. No, I'm not going to go out and ride a bike. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much for joining me. Um, please like, share, and subscribe, and uh, let me know any thoughts you have on these subjects. And until next time, please ride and drive carefully, but have fun while it lasts.
Goodbye. The Rogers are coming. <laughs>